Hi, I'm Chris Lake, and you're now listening to the House Culture Podcast. House Culture. Hi there, everybody. I'm pleased to welcome you to another episode of the House Culture Podcast with me, your host, the managing editor at House Culture, Matt Rouse. Thank you for taking the time to seek us out and press play today. It's a pleasure to be talking to you. And if you're a fan, please remember to do all that good stuff for us by loving, liking and shouting from the rooftops about this show. We couldn't do this podcast without your support. So please keep spreading the word. But if you're new here, thanks for joining us. We are House Culture, a collective of house music fans who have come together through their mutual love of the beat to celebrate the spirit of house music. The main event is over on Instagram at housecultureNet, so make sure you follow that as well so that you can rub shoulders with over 165,000 other party people from the world over. This season of episodes has been our biggest ever, so if you haven't already, please flick through our incredible back catalogue of episodes featuring club culture conversations with legends such as Todd Terry, Roger Sanchez, Judge Jules and Paul Oakenfold. Even further back, you can tune into the musings of new school innovators like Josh Butler, Amsterdam-based artist Luke Van Dyke, or dons of progressive house like Dave Seaman, Danny Tanaglia, and Nick Muir. There really is something to suit all tastes, and even if you don't recognise that name, you should dive in to hear what is always a fascinating story. Speaking of which, let's hear from this month's guest, who is none other than DJ, Grammy-nominated producer and Black Book label owner, Chris Lake. In our chat, Chris tells us how he first discovered the dance music that he loves. I went to the bar that night and then there was a private party next door in the club. The DJ that was playing was playing Progressive House. And I was like, what the fuck is this? This is amazing. How he operates when creating in the studio. I tweak things to death. I listen to sections of songs and just really try to make sure that transitions and and sections move between one another and and, and just invoke the feeling that I intend. I know how I want things to feel and I'm relentless. I'm absolutely relentless in not stopping until I achieve that. And what prompted him to make the move out to the US? I was getting a lot of work out in America. There was was traction happening with my records and I, I really enjoyed the attitude out here. Just felt like you could do whatever you wanted kind of accepted I, I, I enjoyed that I'm honestly doing shows right now I never ever thought I'd be doing and, and having influence in a way even that I, I never thought I'd ever have it's unbelievable it's mind boggling it's great fun so I hope you enjoy this one this is Chris Lake House Culture Hi Chris it's an absolute pleasure to have you on the House Culture podcast today You're from the UK and now reside in the US. You've played all over the world, headlined festivals and released many anthems. However, we always like to roll it back to the beginning and ask, where did you grow up and how did you first discover music that you loved? Well, thanks for having me. Um, All right. Well, this is all the easy stuff. So, (laughs) um, yeah, I'm English. I born in Norwich, Norfolk. Mm lived there I'm, I'm always i'm always a bit vague on the years i think i lived there till i was about 13. Mm-hmm. yeah because i remember i just started becoming a rebellious little shit of a teen and then i left and then i kind of like became a bit better behaved then moved to northern ireland uh-huh. and right before i moved to northern ireland i just started uh, taking keyboard lessons like you know like the, the like the organ kind of lesson so the okay. two-tiered keyboard with the with the foot pedals yeah with the bass pedals and um so i went to the like the technic school of um you know school of music and, and learn learn some that's so that was my like first introduction to music there then um and then moved to northern ireland stopped doing music I was there for a year and then moved to scotland mm-hmm. when i was 14 or 15 and uh yeah lived there for like 10 11 years something like that then moved to london yeah now to la yeah um, and here we are. No way. See, I mean, a tour of the, the British Isles to begin with. Yeah, yeah. I've been about, I mean, the only one I haven't been to is Wales. Um, <laughs> uh, but, you know, because because of the point in my life when I moved, yeah, it's absolutely destroyed my accent. I sound like a complete mongrel. <laughs> you know, like in accent terms, it's like, I think about it like with, with dogs, you know. It's like when a Labrador breeds with a poodle. Yeah. You know, yeah. I've got a bit of a Labradoodle accent. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, English people, English people know there's something up. Scottish people think I'm English. Yeah, uh, uh, Americans think I'm Australian. Of course, uh, I just know that I sound completely <laughs> fucked up. So let's call it international. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, if you do listen back, you know, don't be afraid of hearing your own voice. It's. Uh... Oh, I mean, I'm used. To, I'm used to it now. I've done like I've heard it so much, and I'm like, oh god, I'm just used to being a mongrel. <laughs> cool. I mean, and so when you were traveling around, you said you, you know, you learned the organ, and you know, what was what was that influence then? Was it you know, did you have musical parents, and music was always on in the house? What? How did that come? I didn't about? have musical parents, but mm. I had uh, musical grandparents. So mm. um, my grandfather on my father's side. He played the organ in the in the church actually mm-hmm. um it's kind of like his hobby he was very good at it he was he was, he was very talented at that and uh, i remember going up you know i used to when i when i'd go over to my grandparents houses they, they both had uh essentially like the, like the modern versions of the church organs yeah i don't even know what they're called but anyway i, I used to go over there and I, i'd always like you know mess around and learn how to play and, and so my grandfather on my mother's side he was um he had a slightly more interesting story he was he was a saxophonist in the 50s and 60s with um in like this quite prominent band in Birmingham I can't remember the name of it it'll come to me come anyway to there you. was this band that he was in mm. and they you know they they had they had records on vinyl and stuff like that he was a saxophonist in the in the band and um at one point they were they were out in Hamburg mm-hmm. in Germany performing uh, on the same night as the the Beatles no with way. the when the Beatles were over in Germany performing, this is when uh, with with the original yeah. members yeah. Uh, before before they had the, the change of um, I can't remember I can't remember the names of everyone who changed, but anyway, um, it was a nice little claim to fame. <laughs> but after that, he kind of like you know the sax the, the saxophone playing became a just a, a hobby, you mm-hmm. know, and he got on with the rest of his life. But anyway, there was like this there was this musical influence. I'd used to go I used to go over to my grandparents' houses and play around with the keyboard. But it was my grandfather, the one that played the saxophone. He was like, I think you've got some uh, I think you've got some talent, and he encouraged my mother to to get me to go and do those lessons. Yeah, yeah. And that's when things really started to kick start. You know that the, the, they 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 began, and I. Essentially, when I was when I was when I was doing those lessons, I, I ended up doing like live performances and stuff. And I was much better at the performing than I was at any of the the practical stuff. I I, I was, it was slightly, I, I was kind of I, I was a bit unconventional with pretty much everything I did. Mm. Didn't follow all the rules of what they were teaching me, but I, kind of, I guess I had my own flair. Anyway, when I moved, I stopped doing that, and then when I got to Scotland. I, start, I took music up as one of my options for the, you know, for the GCSEs. GCSEs, yeah. And there I met a friend who was making music on keyboards and synthesizers. And I just thought it was like the best thing ever. Mm-hmm. I realized that you can actually make your own stuff, make your own sounds. And, <laughs> and that's when I started like trying to learn about music and yeah. uh, try to understand this, this whole world. So this would have been in the like 90, mm-hmm. I guess, 97, 98. So I got, I picked up future music and computer music. That was my that was my whole thing. And uh, <laughs> just like dove, died, you know, just, just like dove in headfirst to music production. Realized yeah. I, I need money to buy equipment. Mm-hmm. Started getting jobs as a teenager to uh, you know during uh, during all my school holidays and, and weekends and that to uh, to start making money to to buy synthesizers buy mixers and things like that because it wasn't like buying a computer and then just putting a bit of crack software on your computer and, and getting going it wasn't quite that time mm. so I invested into making music and you know just got it just got going yeah. you know just essentially invested in this little uh this little hobby that then started building some momentum and, yeah. And here I am. And here you are. Many, many years later. So. <laughs> yeah, well, it all paid off in the end. I mean, so you know, you're you're in Scotland, and you you you've, you're like fourteen or, or whatever you said. You, you're getting all this equipment. And you're getting all this stuff together. So it's very much like you were well into that kind of production bent before you had like a clubbing life. I mean, where did the two mm-hmm. kind of collide? Mm-hmm. And and did you, when you first went out kind of clubbing and having that experience with electronic music, did you get inspired? I'm trying to think how I could explain. How, how best to explain it but i i just i didn't have that kind of like that that necessarily stereotypical clubbing experience like a lot of people did mm. i lived in a really really rural part of the country for me to for me to go to events was a lot of effort a lot of a lot of travel 
uh, a lot of rallying of the troops not, <laughs> not, not particularly that hard when you you know when you're young but uh you know for, for, for if i really wanted to go to really good club nights and that i i, I drove down to glasgow or mm -hmm. edinburgh that was a three-hour drive wow no one enjoys that kind of travel <laughs> no. like at any point and that 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 was uh you know but that wasn't until i was really 18 and i I'd, I'd drive down to colors and the, the arches and stuff like that and mm -hmm. that was like my they were some of my really good experiences but like i kind of i essentially learned about dance music in like this sort of almost this uh voyeuristic kind of way i i, I was on message boards and i would just try mm -hmm. to learn and understand what was going on in the scene in other places i just tried to like read about it and visualize what it was about and try yeah. to understand it and that yeah. that was really what that that was that was how i started so I, I started on there was two particular message boards that i was on all the time mm -hmm. a huge tunes message board mm -hmm. a classic kind of this trance record label yeah. if you you know looking back on it um and um the global underground of That's course, important. yeah. Global Underground was huge. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. I think we're a similar age, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So you know exactly what I'm yeah. talking about. So I was an opinionated fuckwit that just thought, you know, um, you know, kind of like uh, developed that sort of highbrow, most things are shit unless Sasha and Digweed have done it, you yeah. know, kind of thing. <laughs> I think that was just the GU board all over, really, wasn't it? That was the GU board all over. Yeah. And and, um, and that kind of defined who, that defined everything that I I. I loved and wanted to do when I was like in the early 2000s I just wanted to I, I thought the coolest thing to do was to try and make records that Sasha and Digweed would play <laughs> that's what I did it well indeed yeah I mean you know so so you, you said you had that kind of voyeuristic view I mean we've spoken to loads of DJs and producers on the podcast and they have this kind of through line of you know going to a club having that experience getting some decks getting some momentum behind their career and then going out and getting gigs and things like that but this was I take it you were maybe producing more and trying to get your tracks into the hands of these people you admired okay so this is the this is the the, the one thing that I didn't mention was that soon after that mm. i started djing I, mm. I did start djing i started doing like um underage events in my local area and i'd play you know pop music and stuff like that and try and feed in like my my uh, the dance music that i was listening to at the time that mm -hmm. wasn't, wasn't particularly you know it's like the 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 dance music for the commoner at the time but <laughs> like the, the, for the common ear like um not the commoner the think of it like ministry of sound kind of dance music like yeah. uh atb yeah 9 a.m till i come dario so that does, g uh, that kind of like yeah 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 yeah, yeah. all yeah, of that sort of yeah. all of that sort of stuff that was like so when i when i was uh at the time what i was doing was i was i was essentially i didn't really know how to write original music i didn't uh, so i was kind of trying to recreate all of these like dance tracks that was that was all i did i just tried to recreate sounds and try to create recreate the feel mm -hmm. that's how i kind of that's, that's how i got started in music that's what i was doing early on yeah. um but yeah i was djing and then i remember i i was i was i was a dj at this local club the club was connected to a bar and and i, I on, on this one night there was a private party so that i went to the bar that night and then there was a private party next door in the club mm -hmm. and i peeked in and like the the dj that was playing was was playing progressive house <laughs> and that was the and i was like what the fuck is this this yeah. is amazing just like and when i say progressive house like for anyone listening now i'm talking like prog as in the the gu kind of like yeah. the, the, the gu board kind of prog it's like it's not i think when when people say progressive house now they think of like um hardwell and um and like the kind of like the edme sort of like progressive it wasn't that Anyway, so um, I just I thought this is unbelievable, and I remember going up to the the guy that was playing, who's now one of my lifelong friends. Mm -hmm. and, um, it's like, hi, I'm I'm Chris. I'm a my music producer, you know, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, I'd love to I'd love to give you I'd love to set like send you a demo, and uh, and uh, and it turned out he was a a head butcher at the local Safeway, <laughs> <laughs> you know. And, uh, um, and he was just DJing on the side, and and, and I remember dropping. I remember taking a demo tape to him in uh, the Safeway. Mm. I haven't thought about it years. It's really funny talking about this, and uh, <laughs> dropping off a dropping off a demo to him at uh, yeah. Safeway, and uh, then him contacted me a little bit later. We became friends, and then he kind of like, you know, he sort of like showed me the 
kind of like showed me the way and like introduced me to a load of like this this music that I'd never really heard and that's how I got into the whole yeah uh, I, like I want to know more about this so that so the way that I learned about that was I went onto the internet mm -hmm. on my dial-up internet and went onto the message boards and tried to learn about this music so yeah that's, that's how that's how I got into it yeah I mean, and, and this was an era, obviously, before like social media, before like r you had to really dig for this stuff and to find those communities online to be able to, you know, these people are listening to what I like and, you know, to go yeah. in there and, and learn about this. And, you know, then you have to have that persona as well. You know, it's, you have to shout very loud on those boards to get noticed and to have an opinion. And yeah. Well, it was that's actually how I first got noticed. Mm. That then I got uh, there was a guy that was working. There was a guy that was working with Huge Tunes at the time, uh, Bobby M. Bobby, uh, I, I don't actually remember exactly what he was doing, mm. but he approached me about. I posted some some of my demos on the Huge Tunes message board, and he responded, "says I really like these. I'd like to. Would you be interested in being managed?" I'm like, I'm "Done." <laughs> let's go let's go let's crack on this is amazing i've made it um and uh you know i couldn't believe that people were like taking pay, paying any attention to what i was doing and, mm. and uh off the back of that I ended up getting the uh one of the demos that i'd done was called santiago de cuba mm -hmm. and that was uh that was played to red jerry who was the the, the a and r the head together the owner of huge tunes and the, yeah. the a and r uh, and they said they wanted to sign it and put it out on lost language mm-hmm and then I realized I'd lost the project for the song. Oh, shit. And I had this render. I I, I spent months trying to recreate it. And I I, uh, I just, I was like, oh, fuck it. I, I had this 192K MP3. Yeah. And I was like, I'm going to convert it to a WAV and then just submit it. And that's, <laughs> that, that, that's what's released. Is, uh, oh, my God. No way. That's what's released. That was my first. I, I was like, I'm not missing this opportunity. Mm um i'm not missing this opportunity so i i, I took my opportunity i just submit the 192k mp3 <laughs> uh, um and that was that that got me started so that, yeah. that kind of like that was my first original song i remember making that with my mc505 and no way. Uh, roland mc505 and my uh you know my all the all these other synthesizers but that was mostly made on that yeah actually i think i was, I was starting to use computers i was starting to use computers to record by that point mm. And that was half the problem. I didn't really, I wasn't very good at using all that, all that software. And I just like, I wasn't backing things up and it all, it all went to shit. But anyway, yeah, that, that was the first song. Oh man. So ask me another question. Give me more direction. Yeah. yeah. So, so, <laughs> so in, in terms of like having that released on Lost Language, obviously Lost Language was like the subsidiary of Huge, Huge wasn't it? It was like a bit more, I suppose, a bit more yeah. progressive. What was that moment like when maybe you went somewhere and saw someone playing it or someone told you that someone had played it or anything like that? Was there any... Yeah, it was just nice. And I think that was, you know, that that's really at the core of everything that I've ever loved in the scene. I, I, I like, um, I just like making music that just that gets <laughs> reactions from people. I've always loved it. It's, yeah. it's, it's nice. I got still connect to that feeling, mm. uh, very, that, that feeling exactly today, you know, to music I made yesterday. It's, yeah. it's exactly the same thing that I'm looking for. It's sort of like at the, at the core of my, um, my drive and my values. It's just fun. It's really fun. Yeah, I, I, you know, it's an unquenchable fire. It's, you know, it's, that's what always should burn, like that creativity is something it should always stoke. But at the, at the root of it, it's kind of, you know, it is, it's quite selfish. A lot of it's for me. I, I like it. It fuels me. But I also like the, 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 the beautiful side effect of it is it comes from making people happy. Yeah. It's yeah. great. It's just, it's just, it's, uh, it's, uh, well, I think so. <laughs> I, hope, I hope it makes more people happy than it makes people go, <laughs> you know but anyway i'll never i'll never know i'll, I'll, I'll focus on the happiness side of it. indeed indeed and so i mean for me like you know we've talked about like the gu board and things like that and you know you certainly came to my attention like back in it was about i think it was like 2002 and you did like the re-edit of the prodigies climatize, climatize. um yeah. you know and that was before things like soundcloud existed and stuff like that and i always loved that tune on fat of the land that album and i always thought there should have been like a dancier version of it all right so i'll tell you the story about that one i i do you know I, I don't i don't remember all of the details but i remember what it resulted in mm. i had a i had a distrib i, I kind of had a bit of a like a hooky distribution thing going on with uh for some of my bootlegs i was making i was making quite a few of them at the time mm -hmm. 
And I remember, I think must that record must have got some radio play. And I remember, I I, I know that I'd seeded a copy of it to Sasha Digweed. I I'd, I'd, I'd yeah. seeded it to some of the main DJs that were playing, and it was a, and and it got it got absolutely rinsed by all of the main headliners at what was the big festival at the time? It wasn't Homelands, yeah, Homelands and like Creamfields mm-hmm. and, and like uh, like it was there was only a few festivals at the yeah. time uh, around about that time, but it was like. The main festivals that were playing, that song got rinsed. And uh, anyway, we I contacted that, that, that distribution and I paid for, I paid to get a load of, um, I, kept, I paid to get a load of copies, uh, copies of that record made, and I got, uh, I got them shipped to my house up in Scotland. Mm-hmm. And I remember we ordered three thousand copies. Yeah. I don't know if this rings any bells if you had a copy because we said on the cop on the record. Does it say a thousand? One of five hundred. One of five hundred. <laughs> one of five hundred. I've still got my copy downstairs somewhere. I'll oh, right, have to dig okay. it out. This is the thing. That copy was so we we sh- I I remember this. We sh- we we had we we got them all shipped to the house and we th- we didn't pay for the labels. I remember I to save money because my father at the factory that he works at he had a label maker. So to save money, we got them all shipped to the house, and then we um, made the labels at my father's factory, and we all sat there, my, my family, and we all labeled up the records ourselves, and then um, and sold them directly to ten record stores, and we sold all. I mean, I remember like uh, hard to find. Mm-hmm. I swear, hard to find records. They bought two thousand of them just alone. Yeah, which was a lot. That was a, that was a lot of yeah. that was a lot of records. He was selling if he was selling over a thousand records. It was pretty un- unbelievable at that time because no one was buying music nobody mm-hmm. it was all like it just it just it was really really hard i would that was one of the most unfortunate things of like the era era that i came up i missed all of the all of the financial ability to sustain yourself through only making music yeah it all went to shit through <laughs> it all went to shit and um it's kind of like a yeah, it's fucked. <laughs> well, I was really happy that I could make anything. So yeah. I sold all three thousand copies, and it was really, really popular. And it was really fun. But I, I, I have, I like it's, it's one of my fondest memories of being sat there in the living room with my whole family labeling up the records and then shipping them out to the record stores. <laughs> but I actually, I got called. I remember calling up all the record stores and trying to uh, and get and making the orders for the like how many how many do you want to buy? Yeah, it's yeah, great. amazing, amazing. It's yeah, it's, it's yeah, it's just. Hilarious that there's there is I should have bought it in the room here and uh, shown it to you that would have been a weird serendipitous moment that it's all gone full circle. Um, so I mean so after that like that was 2002 obviously it had blown up it had been absolutely rinsed like what was the next step for you you know obviously in 2006 when like changes came out that was like felt like the big moment like your arrival would you yeah. agree with that? Yeah, that was that was that was the uh, that was the moment where everything started becoming legitimate. Before that, I was fucking around, to be honest with you. But in that period between climatize and um, and that point, I got a little bit lost. Mm-hmm. Um, and I uh, actually that guy, the original guy that I told you about, Bobby, I I, I, I um, he actually ended up he passed away many years ago. He uh, um, stopped stopped working with him, and um, I, I I basically I was I wasn't being managed and. Uh, because I, I wasn't really working very efficiently or anything and uh, mm. I, I got to this pivotal point where i'm like i need to get my shit together I'm, I'm, i gave my and, and about a year before that changes record came out i gave myself a year and like i i said to my friends and family i'm like if i don't make something significant happen with my career here um within a year i'll pivot and i'll pursue education and a career you know mm-hmm. build, build something more tangible and so I started working really hard. And at the time I was working, at, I was uh, as a postman, um, the post office. I did that for three years. I was doing that for 32 hours a week. And uh, and so in, in all the off time, I was just working really hard, just trying to make music. And that's mm-hmm. where I made. Uh, there was a brace of records that really got my attention. There was, there was changes, uh, release, one too many, and uh, fantasy, I think. Mm-hmm. And that was where I started. That's, there were there were tunes where I started uh, rising music to release my own music. I signed changes to uh, Alternative Route, Desi Masiello's label, because he wanted to put that on his uh, compilation. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I got a manager. I started working with Dean Wilson, for, um, who's now at um, Seven Twenty Management, founded Three Sixty Management, and was with the company that was responsible for 
myself, Dead Mouse, and Calvin Harris. Yeah. Um, uh, so started working with him and um and things you know things really just like spiraled off the back of that that's where i started becoming professional but still i mean like i look back at it and i didn't you know i was just still that kid that was like still trying to like look at things from a distance and trying to understand what the fuck i was and what i was doing mm -hmm. um visually i didn't have a clue what i was doing i didn't know what i was presenting to the world but the one thing that i the, the one thing that i felt i was always pretty good at was just making the music yeah yeah. how i was presented to the world was pretty fucked um i'm definitely a lot better at doing that now but um yeah but things you know that that's where that's where i really started internationally touring mm -hmm. and I, I haven't stopped since yeah so you know to go from that kind of like you say like being a postman a bit of a wide-eyed kid still and then you know huge you're traveling the world and playing these gigs and whatever you know was there ever a moment where what thinking back like what was a real kind of holy shit moment for you? I mean, there's been loads of them. Um, <laughs> Specifically around that kind of era where it's kind of, it really started to take I off. I think it was the, I think, you know, getting getting a record in the top 40 and it was great. I mean, looking back on it, look, I, I, I've been, there's been moments where I've allowed uh, external influence to kind of, um, to guide me to do things that I probably just naturally wouldn't want to do. For example, like the, getting the vocal on changes was mm -hmm. absolutely not my idea. I, I definitely did not want to do it. And I didn't feel comfortable with it. I never loved the idea of putting a vocal on there. I completely think that that vocal works, but it doesn't, mm. it, but it's not the, um, it's, it also doesn't give the, it doesn't give the, the, the same, uh, the, the same feeling that the original did in its instrumental form. That was like the, that was, that was the most, that was how I intended it to feel. But, um, but anyway, you know, that happened. And then, you know, over time, I learned how to do those records myself and write those vocals myself. And, yeah. Um, you know, but that's just that's just evolution. So but that that was a really great moment, like getting, you know, doing my first major record deal and or, or signing, you know, fi signing a single to someone. And uh, so I did that to Apollo, which was uh, universal, I think. And, uh, you know, getting my first big advance was, was, was huge for me. Mm -hmm. You know, what did you buy with it? Well, I got, I got, um, I got twenty five grand for it. I got twenty five grand for the single, which is really annoying because there was another, there was another offer on the table from Ministry that was far, far bigger. But there was a, <laughs> but the label owner, um, the label owner for, um, for alternative, the, the label uh, manager for alternative route had a really good relationship with Apollo, and she really wanted to go with, um, go that route. So I went along with it, and um, so anyway, I got, I bought. I paid off my student loan. Mm -hmm. I cleared the debt on my car, and I put a down payment on the house. Very sensible. Yeah, I lived off the back of it. Honestly, yeah. I, I like I, I have. I, I've, I've been I've been pretty sensible with this stuff. So <laughs> I think cool. And I mean, you know, obviously we're talking about that changes of like two thousand and six. You know, it's twenty twenty three now. So you know, what like how is your production process? changed over that time you know is it is it inconceivably different from like where it was back then to now or do you still hold some things dear in terms of i love this bit of equipment i'm always going to use that mentally i'm the same but i mean yeah, I, well, I didn't use ableton when i was you know when i when i first started i, I just rinse ableton now I, i'm very very quick i kind of i used to only work in a studio now i kind of it's funny. I was just, I was talking about this last night with my friend downstairs. Uh, I worked yesterday, and I must have worked on ten projects. No, I'm not kidding. I was just like hot swapping between like different things that I'm working on, making little adjustments. Yeah. And I did everything in my echoey kitchen <laughs> on the laptop speakers. No way. <laughs> and I made final mix adjustments and rendered out the track and submitted it to a label. Wow. I didn't even check it on speakers. <laughs> <laughs> like it's, it's just weird i love that, that that's different I, that, that's how, that's kind of how i you know i, I work like that now and i kind mm. of uh i trust my ears i trust my you know trust my environments and, yeah and yeah all, yeah you know, and like having just, that trust in I, know, your... I know what i'm doing there was yeah. a lot more guesswork before i was kind of like you know i, I hadn't done my ten thousand hours I, I, or you know I, I i i feel like i it's ironic i feel like i, I really hit the point where I, I felt like i was i knew what i was doing about 10 years ago mm -hmm. i remember hit i remember when i hit 30 and i was like okay something's changed here like this is starting to click yeah, yeah. it really started to feel like you know like i've moved into a different phase well you're talking about 
listening to new material there that you're making and trusting your own ears and having that you know that trust in yourself and that confidence um you know how are you when you're dealing with that new material do you like to road test it and tweak things after the fact or do you just finalize it and like bang it's done it's out. no 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 i tweak things to death yeah I really do um and it's uh it's a strange uncomfortable process <laughs> i find it quite emotional actually like not not in like a like i'm gonna break down and sob kind of thing but i really like i, I just I listen to sections of songs and just really try to make sure that transitions and, and, and sections move between one another and, and, and just invoke the feeling that I intend. And I, I, that's one thing I've got, you know, I can recognize in my older music that I, I was kind of like starting to become in tune with. And now I've just got like now through the better understanding of technology and how to use it. And, yeah. um, I've learned how to accentuate those moments and things that the, 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 the feelings that I, I want to portray in my music and and uh, and execute them but essentially i i know how i want things to feel and i'm relentless i'm absolutely relentless in not stopping until i achieve that mm -hmm. and it's a miserable process <laughs> it's a fucking miserable process it really is i get really pissed off in this room sometimes trying to trying to pursue it mm -hmm. however i do think that it um I do think it separates me from quite a lot of people where in my opinion maybe it's just because that's what I focus on but I I it's, it's it's sort of like detail that I I think is absent in a lot of people's work that would be in a similar space to mine not everyone's but like a lot of people so I you know it's just something I put a lot of focus into so it's when I, especially when I have a lot of faith in the idea mm -hmm. I put a lot of effort into trying to execute it exactly the way that I want to do it you like say if it's it's a miserable experience if you're hot swapping between loads of different projects as well and like continually tweaking and tweaking across multiple different things I mean that that's not necessarily so typical it was just what just how it ended up yesterday I was absolutely on one I was like I've got, you know I've got, I've got I, the other thing is I've got you know I've got quite important shows coming up I, mm -hmm. I I have a reason to try and get things finished so um it's given it's given me a bit of urgency to try and make things happen yeah yeah so when when you're working as well you've obviously done some collaborations over the years and worked with people like Armin van helden and like all sorts of different artists and singers and creatives and whatever like how do you like collaboration do you like yeah. an element of control how what's your flow in the studio when you're collaborating no i, lo I love it it's um it it's an opportunity to uh experience a different energy from mm -hmm. people um uh, a different vantage point new ideas new sounds but just sometimes <laughs> you know it's just about look i i i've, I've worked with lots of people and i i always emphasize this and i and i i wish that more people would do this i i arrange to get in a room with people and or or i you know we, we talk about talk about working or whatever or talk about meeting up and i have no intention on the end product it's not that that's not my focus i i'm like, I'm, I'm far more focused immediately on making a connection with the person mm -hmm. and um and the vibes feeling good. I I don't want to work with people that I don't get on with. I don't want to work with people where the yeah. um, for the goal of trying to be, be become more popular, but uh, or you know trying to tap into someone's uh, uh, market and reach. Yeah. I've got no interest in that. I I I want to work with people that I genuinely want to work with, and I really really enjoy it. And you know, um, uh, so really, it's just about kind of like inviting people over and having fun, and you know, just trying to feel the soul I have, I have a great i have a great time here i love i love working with people yeah well it's a good creed to have you know to stick by that and just feel yeah like you say no end product no no foresight in terms of what you're going to be putting out it's just about yeah just getting on with someone and seeing how you bounce ideas off each other well i will say this as well it's like i mean i i understand like the perception that people have of like different artists and you know maybe what people the perception that people might have of me and I, i've always found it's quite a nice tool as well to expand the possibility of who i can actually get in the room with and who i can work with where i go i've said it to many people i'm just like look you know if you're down let's, let's hang see if we you know maybe play some stuff in the studio to each other and if there's a vibe see what happens yeah and you know and uh 
that's happened on several occasions and and, and brought about some great results you know working with people that uh maybe people wouldn't expect me to mm -hmm. to work with yeah like a green velvet or mm -hmm. or grimes for example grimes is a great example yeah it was uh it was uh you know and uh we had a great time in the studio we had a great time I had a great laugh yeah that's great you know and, and in terms of having that open mind you know you obviously work with new talent you run black book records you know that started in 2017 um you know and that was also before that you did rising records as well you know what um what was your ideas around starting a label what why did you want to do that initially it was just to release my own music um and then i mean soon after uh, I definitely started realizing, you know, there was a there was an ability to kind of help and be involved in other people's careers. You know, like um, there was like the, the 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 early involvement with um, seeing the potential in Dead Mouse was quite influential on me. When mm. I ended up getting sent a vinyl of his um, his his side project, BSOD. BSOD was uh, his collaboration. That was Joel and um, Steve Duda. Steve Duda is the creator of the the synthesizer the, the vst serum which yeah, everyone right. uses mm -hmm. so that yeah so steve and uh, steve and uh, and joel had made this this bod this track called bsod a bit sketchy it was sent to me on vinyl mm -hmm. and i contacted the distributor and i was like what the fuck is this i've not heard anything like this before it stood out a country mile the production was ridiculous it was like it was just different and i remember um finding out who it was reaching out to joel starting to speak to him online, send him music, realizing, oh my God, there's something really good here. Mm. Ended up going out and working with him for two weeks and realizing this whole situation and what the potential was with him. And I remember calling my manager at the time and uh, Dean and saying, you've got to sign this kid. You have to sign this kid. I, I, and I remember the quote as clear as day. And I said to him, you get it right with him and make you millions. And it was, that's, I, I, I told I told Joel, you know, uh, there's an option here, mm -hmm. and uh, they ended up working together. They're still together. Amazing. They made each other millions. <laughs> so that was influential on me. Yeah. That was influential on me because I, I look, I, I have, um, I'm able to tell those stories, mm -hmm. um, but I also had no, I had no financial involvement in that. Uh, an astute version of me probably could have had an involvement, in that, <laughs> well, but I didn't um i never had any financial involvement at all so mm. um but that was uh but it was influential it was nice to feel like i could uh i could be part of helping people it made me feel good yeah the same thing as like, making me feel good about like getting feedback on my own music i like that feeling i like the feeling of helping people mm -hmm. and um and when they have talent and he listen he's a he's a he's a difficult human but he's a bloody talented musician and he made a huge mark on the scene and i'm very proud of that leading on to that it was quite funny you know i was talking about this with him the other day but i was with skrillex mm -hmm. and skrillex really got his big break on dead mouse's label so it's like full circle mm -hmm. it's like i feel like i, I said this to sunny i'm like you know you gotta you gotta ask yourself a question like would, would, would it all have worked the same way if if uh if mouse hadn't had that start and like you know linked up with dean and kind of like had the trajectory that he had and so I was like, so yeah, basically I, I created Skrillex. <laughs> <laughs> but we, you know, we hang out now. He's like, he's one of my, he's one of my closest friends, mm. um, uh, you know, and it's, it's, it's a nice feeling. It's a nice yeah. feeling having sort of a, even, even if it's the smallest, even if it's the smallest part, I, I really enjoy that sort of stuff. Well, it's the ripples, isn't it? You know, you're making these connections and having this influence and, you know, like you say, you just like to see people do well who have got talent and making good stuff still now to say yeah i mean it, it, anything you know just just as just as much as you know when they first started so it's, mm -hmm. it's nice nice feeling <laughs> i bet it is so uh, you've lived in america for like uh, how long have you lived there over 10 years it must uh, be. Uh, yeah 11 years now yeah. yeah yeah and you know what kind of prompted that move and how have you seen the scene change during your time living over there yeah, so I moved out here, I guess, probably like the, the, the sort of around like that EDM kind of era. Mm -hmm. I felt like the scene was dying on its ass. I got caught up in the EDM thing right at the beginning. I started listening to people and like getting influenced on what I should be doing with my music and quite a miserable, dark period, to be honest with you. But um, 
but I was getting a lot of work out in America. There was there was traction happening with my records, and I, I really enjoyed the attitude out here. Of just felt like you could do whatever you wanted, and it was kind of accepted. I I, I enjoyed that. Mm. I just followed the opportunity. I felt like I'd done some really fun things in Europe, but I felt like this calling here. My wife, um, she lived in America most of her life. She felt comfortable out here. You know, yeah. happy wife, happy life. So, um, yeah, we came out here and made a go of it and it's been it's been really fun watching that watching the progression of a scene that even though it's essentially it completely started here um it didn't continue here in a in the way that in the way that the scene was adopted in europe in the uk um in in core of like youth culture so it was nice to be involved in it and, and now seeing it in comparison to what it was like um you know 11 years ago it's grown up so much it's so yeah. deep it's so like uh um it's really it's just really popular it's, it's really nice to and it's nice to be involved in it and do and do um i'm honestly doing shows right now i never ever thought i'd be doing and i, I like and, and having um you know influence in a way even that i i never thought i'd ever have it's I, unbelievable it's mind-boggling it's great fun yeah <laughs> Yeah, you know, I think looking at it from like a cultural perspective as well, like you say, it started in the States, um, like house music, dance music, whatever you want to call it. And, you know, then Europe kind of adopted it, morphed it into its own thing. And then, you know, the, obviously the EDM explosion, you know, 10, 15 years ago, it's kind of much maligned at the moment with like hindsight. However, you know, that for me, looking at it now is kind of like that was like the gateway drug for a whole new scene of people, like you say, who have grown up. And they are into dance culture, and that's something that they never had before, really. Yeah, it's great, and, and uh, you know, it's, just, it's just the way it works. It's like I, I always believed in it. I, it's like I was, I always believed that would happen. I, I, like people's tastes change all the time. It's, uh, um, I, I always had faith that it would, it would, it would, it would grow like this, and um, yeah, it's, it's just great to be involved in it. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, you, you've kind of alluded to it as well in like that, you know, there was a dark period or, you know, you were doing things that you weren't necessarily completely invested in yourself. And you've been quite open in like uh, other interviews and things that I've read about, you know, taking stock of your own sound and, you know, course correcting yourself back to a place where you felt more connected to the music. I mean, can you mm -hmm. tell us kind of just elaborate on that a little bit and why you did it and why? Yeah, it's so look, look, you know, it, it was it, it's. <laughs> If you were to ask me, like, what my what I'm most proud of in my career, the thing that I'm most proud of in my career is that I com I had essentially for me I had completely gone off track and and uh, departed from my core values and allowed external influence and 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 and, and had I'd stopped using my my intrinsic like judgment. At the core of my career and and i and the thing that i'm the most proud of is that i i recognized it adjusted it and i didn't have confidence in my own music as well i'd started uh i'd started exploring working with uh other engineers to try and get a sound it wasn't really ending up feeling like my own anyway of course corrected mm. i recognized i just knew i knew i was i was doing things that i wasn't i was just wasn't enjoying i was taking shows i wasn't enjoying i was i was playing some music i wasn't fully loving i was i was playing music for reactions rather than i was i was, I was kind of like i was playing a game which mm. is not what i ever wanted to do i'd never wanted to play a game and anyway of course corrected I, I remember having this moment in uh i think i was in korea and i was playing a show and i was just like what the fuck am i doing and um i did i just had this moment i was like what the fuck am i doing i went to scotland so shortly after and i was uh, went to my parents house and uh had a few days there and just like just kind of like mentally took stock trying to figure out what i was doing and just started you know making music that felt more connected to me again and that, that yeah. was like the bedrock of like, okay all right i'm i'm gonna i'm gonna course correct i'm gonna do whatever i can to get my career back on track and um i'd started working with a new manager by this point my current manager and we made a, a long-term plan on what i was going to do and what I wanted to be and where, where you know, and uh, how I was going to do it. And we enacted it. Mm -hmm. And it's all happened. <laughs> no way. Tick, tick. All of it. Bar, like, bar none. 
and it's 20 times better than I ever expected. Well, I, yeah. and I'm, 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 really, I'm really proud of it. I'm really yeah. proud of, I'm really proud of like, I'm really proud of, um, I, I knew what, I knew probably what the right decision was to do. And the right decision was to go sack it all off, build a wall around it, start a new project. Yeah. That would have been the easiest thing to do. And that's probably what I would have recommended anyone to do. Mm-hmm. But I was like, nah, this is my name. This is my real name. And I feel like this is a reflection on me. And I really wanted to, um, I wanted to, I wanted to fix it. I wanted yeah. to, I wanted to present things the way that I, that, that, um, that I felt comfortable with. So, you know, I, I did it and I, I, I am genuinely, I'm genuinely proud of it. And, uh, you know, I don't give a shit what people think about it because I'm happy with it. So. No, I mean, you should be proud because that's a really brave move to be like, right, because it would just be so easy just to be like, you know, even if you're on stage or at a gig or whatever, like, what the fuck am I doing? I'm playing music I don't really like, but it'd just be so easy just to continue doing that and getting kind of rewarded for it, but not like emotionally. And and, and this is the thing, you know, and I, I don't like that. That's been you know over 10 years now i you know, i don't make decisions for i don't make decisions for um for money yeah. i don't make decisions for uh, i don't play like it, you're talking about that playing that game i just don't do it and 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 the and i don't do things to fit in either mm-hmm. i do things that fit for me that's a that's a big it's a it's a bit it's a big thing and i and I like and i and it, and it, it does it makes me it makes me happy and it makes me feel very comfortable with what i do because it, it intrinsically it's right for me what, yeah. I, what i do so yeah anyway, it sounds kind of deep but yeah no it should be you know you're looking into yourself and you're you're recognizing these aspects of your own personality that you want to you you know you want to hold dear to you to yourself to move forward it's it's, it's what we should all yeah. be doing more of to be honest uh, right i want to talk to you about um more kind of modern times earlier this year you dropped the vip remix of deceiver um your collab with green velvet you've already mentioned his name I mean, this has been, this track has been a long time coming. I feel like on your, you know, every time I've seen it posted somewhere on a video or something like that, just the comments of people just begging for this tune. Um, you know, can you tell us about like the gestation of that track, why that version of it took so long to come out and why would now was the right time to kind of release it? It's pretty simple. It's pretty simple. I had no intention of releasing it. I um, okay. During COVID... Chris, uh, my uh, my mate Chris Lorenzo um, was doing one of those drive-in shows, and he calls me up and he's like, "A drive-in show in a couple of days. I want you to make a VIP of one of your songs, make me a special version." I was like, "Fuck off, mate!" <laughs> Hung up the phone, and I was like, "Maybe I should give it a try. Maybe I'll try do something." And I I I was like, "Do you know what? I'll, I'll pull in the pull in the stems for for the uh, Deceiver. I'll give it a go." And mm. um, I did that in an hour. It took a, it, it took an hour to knock up, and I was like, Do you know what, sweet. I never, t- I've never, I've never touched it since. I never did anything else to it. And uh, I gave it to Chris, and he's like, "Mate, that version absolutely tore the roof off the place when he played it." And I'm like, "Okay, sweet. I'm gonna just uh, well, there's a nice little version that only me and you have." I gave it to Fish as well. Mm-hmm. It was just the three of us that had it, um, and uh, I actually forgot to give it to Curtis, like. For years, I only gave it to him like six months ago or something. I felt really, I, when I realized, I was like, oh shit, I should have really, like, it's really bad that I never sent it to him. But, um, sorry, Curtis. <laughs> and, uh, but I, anyway, I, you know, I've been playing it for years and I'm like, Do you know what? I've got, I've got a lot of, uh, I like having versions that only, that only, I only have to play because it's sort of, uh, yeah, listen, it's a very difficult scene now. There's so much music out there. It's so easy to get most things that, mm-hmm. that, uh, that are out there quite quickly um the only way that i can have any separation or or give any separation for my live shows is to have things that no one else has and it's and it's normally involving things that i've made so i kept that as something to make my my, make my sets different and unique um for a while but i was you know i just got to that point of like i've been working hard lately and i've got a load of new music that i'm making to you know to reinvigorate my my sets from in regards to the music that i'm that I've made for my sets, and uh, I was like, you know what, it's, it's time I can I can give this up. So let 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 people have. For me, it reminded me of that kind of era, like you know, we've talked about that progressive house era, where there would be DJs that would have tracks, like a few would have like a copy of something, 
and it would either never be released or you know it'd take years to come out and if you wanted to hear that you would have to hope that they played it when you went to watch them live what's the unfortunate thing we all want we, we all want what we can't have <laughs> Well, if I don't give it to anyone, no one can have it. So it's like, it, 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 you know, it creates some demand. It does work. All right. So um, I want to talk about Fisher as well. You've already mentioned him. And before we turned on the mics as well, you said that you're going to be flying out and seeing him in Vegas and you're going to catch up. You haven't seen each other for a while. You know, how did you guys first kind of meet? Because his kind of story and entry to the to the world of dance music is quite interesting. Obviously, he was a pro surfer. Yeah. Um, you know, what's yeah. your relationship? So, you know, we're, we're nothing alike, but just like just that's quite a uh, a common thing with some of the people that i'm closest with i'd say some of the the closest people um in my life would be chris lorenzo fish uh mickey slim they're all fucking nutbags and i'm not like that i'm a really chill and i i, I just really get on well with these crazy people and uh yeah, I met Fish through my manager uh, Brett. He was he was managing him as well. He was managing Cut Snake, and uh, um, that was a, that was the his project with um, Lee Sedley. Mm-hmm. Lee Sedley. And, uh, um, I met him and just got on really well with both of them. I, I, I love them. They're, they're like really truly great guys. Really great guys, and um, love the music and the energy is so so refreshing. People are seeing that now. Mm. That that. Um, his energy is truly infectious and and uh you know the, <laughs> it's difficult to have a bad night out with fish it really is he is so much fun mm-hmm. unless he's a bad unless he's in a bad mood and he's a fucking miserable wretched cunt to be with <laughs> <laughs> um but uh you know just like anyone but he, he's, he's brilliant I, I love him and um you know we just have we just have a great relationship we're just friends and he's 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 massively helped me with my um his opinions on my music and my you know what i'm doing and even though i you know i was was explained to you i you know i'm I'm quite decisive and i do things for myself and Mm -hmm. you know it doesn't mean i don't have influence but i choose who you know i choose who influences me for sure and uh he's definitely one of them he's been He's been fantastic. His energy's his, his, his energy's phenomenal. Anyway, you know we all, we all have the we have the same manager and um, a lot of the same friends and colleagues and everything. And uh, yeah, it's just great. It's great. He's a he's a fantastic energy to have. It's, 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 I'm 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 so happy for I'm so happy for how he's um you know how how things have progressed for him over the over the last few years. It's been phenomenal. And I, the fact that I get to go up on stage with him as well and do these back to backs that like is one of our um, it's actually him calling now. Um, <laughs> uh, it's one of our most popular things to to do. Yeah. It's like our most requested booking. Yeah. Um, you know, we don't do it very often. I just love. I, lo- I love going up, getting up on stage and just having having a laugh with him. It's fantastic. It's the time of the interview where we do the House Culture Perfect playlist. You've submitted five tracks based on our themes. You can find the tr- playlist on Spotify. It's House Culture Perfect playlist. Everyone submitted to this. Um, And we always start, the first theme is a catalyst tune, something that opened your ears to electronic music, got you into dance music. You have chosen Robert Miles' Children. Why did you choose that? I was in Northern Ireland. I was in school. I don't know what was happening. It was like one of those free periods or whatever. And that song came on the radio. And I just, it mesmerized me. I'll, I'll never forget that feeling of first hearing that record that was that that was the first time i was like oh, i'm i you know I, I i it just it lit something up inside of me i think that song's magical i still listen to it regularly mm-hmm. um i think it's a phenomenal song the story behind it's fantastic yeah. it's a it's a, you know, it's a truly inspirational piece of music it deserves all the plaudits it gets yeah but it was it was the gateway song for me to, to get into dance music i love it Perfect. And so I've asked you for a floor filler. You have chosen your own edit. Oh, well, I did. I said, I said my one, didn't I? I yeah. said, I said, uh, I said, uh, Prince Funk and Roll. That's right. Yeah. This thing's a beast. But um, I can't release the bloody thing because of Prince. And yeah. Uh, um, yeah, I've so I tried so hard to get this thing released um, before he passed. But um, everyone loved it, but couldn't get it past Prince. Oh. So, um, all, all the producers involved in the song. Uh, the label they all wanted they all wanted to do it um it's probably one of my favorite things i ever did 
But anyway, yeah. High it praise. just absolutely goes off. Yeah. Every time I can play it anywhere, it works a treat. So anyway. Great choice. Great choice. Uh, okay. A sunsetter. You've chosen um, your response, uh, Ringo. Oh, yeah. I don't know. I just, I like, I love Yoris. I love his production. I think um touches into that old uh, pr- prog kind mm-hmm. of um, prog vibe. But I, I just think he, I, he just tapped into a truly unique, emotion on that song and i just i've played it a few times in settings like that i just think it's a stunning record ironically i could have chosen that record for the next one indeed for your next question yeah i could have i could have chosen that one yeah it's highly is... emotional yeah i mean yeah so a tearjerker <laughs> is the next one which uh and you've chosen do you want to say what you've chosen yeah yeah i've chosen uh, um massive attack teardrop <sighs> I'm quite determined for that song to be played at my funeral so that everyone sobs at my passing. Um, (laughs) (laughs) I just think the song is absolutely fantastic. It's the, if there was any song that I could wish that I had made, it's that one. I think it's phenomenal. The way that it crescendos up and uh, I can't remember the bit, like towards the end of the song. (laughs) With the big strings, then it drops them. I love trip hop. It's fantastic. Yeah, I so do I. It's, it's got that iconic video as well with the baby. Yeah, it's just yeah, it's mesmerising that tune. Um, okay, a last tune. Crowd are asking for one more. You've sent me the link to this on SoundCloud, which is I just saw the title of it and was like, oh, it can't be like a sample from Cypress Hill. And it's yeah, it's go on, say what it is. <laughs> It's the cause and effect bootleg of um, uh, Snatch My Crops. I don't even know what the original song is. Uh, like insane the, the, in the, the Brain, the, the, yeah. In the Brain, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, it's, yeah, and, then, and then, yeah, the sample is, cops come and try and snatch my crops. You play you play it, you, you, like, you put it on, and, and um, you know, it starts with the Cypress Hill song, and and, and, and I, I'm sure everyone's thinking, oh, my God, here we go. It's a fucking house DJ being ironic, playing a kind of hip-hop record or whatever, and... Um, and then it then then it switches up and goes into the house tempo and it's so much fun it just like the way that it drops the way that it switches up and um it just lights everyone up it's a great way to send everyone off on their uh send everyone send everyone off on, uh, on a night out at least for my sets anyway i love it it's brilliant as it should be yeah. and it's also cause and effect is uh you know one half of that is uh chris lorenzo who's mm-hmm. my, one of my best mates so it's time for the final question. We always ask our um, guests, this is the final question. We are house culture. You are part of the house culture podcast now. Um, the term house culture in terms of a scene, um, what's your view on it? And what do you think it's brought you in your life? I've always felt that like house culture is kind of um, openness. I, I, I think of it as like a kind of like a community kind of thing. It's like a, um, I've always felt that it's a, quite an open open culture it's like um and, and quite inclusive as well I, I always i always enjoy the fact that um i felt like uh on the event side it was like this sort of like license a place and a scene and a license to kind of like uh be who you are and be who you want to be kind of thing and uh it was the, you know that, that was that was the place where uh, you know i got to experience all different cultures and different sexualities and, and all things like that and i i um i, va- I value it i i value the fact that the the uh that that the scene is kind of like giving me exposure and understanding to all of these uh all of these side of things so that's what i think about when i think about house culture and I just think about that's honestly that's pretty that that's the yeah. main thing that i think yeah. about i just that um like this sort of just bring it but this bringing the people uh, this uh this culture of bringing people together i love it it's uh the vibes are fantastic at house events i don't i don't have much else to offer them no <laughs> that, that is, that's where my head goes. yeah that's a perfect place to, to to finish on that's a great final thought so thank you for taking part thank you very much it was great fun great talking take care house culture that was great fun wasn't it Thanks to Chris for finding the time to chat to us ahead of him jetting over to Vegas to party with his good friend Fisher. I can only imagine what you guys got up to. It was also so interesting to hear about Chris's journey in discovering dance music from afar, especially by frequenting things like the Global Underground message board. I'm sure there are a few people listening right now who can remember that one, myself included. 
Chris's latest release, Beggin, is out now and is an infectious affair featuring the sultry pipes of singer-songwriter Aluna. Make sure you check it out in all the usual places. And if you can't get enough of sick beats like that, make sure you hit up the House Culture Perfect playlist on Spotify, which features not only Chris's stellar submissions, but also those of every other guest that has graced this show. Stick it on shuffle, turn the volume to maximum. Whilst you're there, please drop us a comment about this episode in the Q&A section under the episode description. Or if you're not on Spotify, leave us a review on Apple, some feedback on YouTube or your thoughts on Instagram. If you have enjoyed this episode, there really is no excuse. We love to hear from you and anyone who says something nice will get a shout out on a future episode. Which is why I'm saying a huge hi to the Instagrammer Real Rich Neeks, who got in touch to tell us that he thinks our podcast is excellent and how we should keep pushing because it is important to the culture. You said it, man. It's exactly what drives us on. Thanks for that wonderful message. Don't forget that you can get in touch with us the same way on Instagram by following us at HouseCultureNet or by following the hashtag TrueHouseCulture. And if you haven't already, you can follow me directly on Instagram at DJ Matt Rouse. Thanks for listening. Rave safe. And see you next time. House Culture.